not much left for me to say anymore because um, he's introduced practically everything that I want to say here today. I'm just going to try and you know maybe deeper into one or two things, but really, basically everything he said this morning um, is what I prepared also to speak about. But like I said, I will just go a bit deeper into one or two things. Um, I work in the finance industry, and by virtue of my job, I have um, about 13 years experience now in banking. By virtue of my job, I meet with different people, uh, business people, daily. Daily, I meet with business people. And so over the years, from my interactions with them, I've come away with one or two things. And I would like to share some of those things with us here. And um, we meet with a lot of these people, especially when it comes to um, banking transactions, financing, startups, and all of that. And from experience, a lot of them um, get turned down. You know, and I know that one of the things people tend to talk about, especially in this part of the world, is that banks do not help people. Banks do not support people. In Nigeria, banks don't help. A lot of people don't like banks, I know. <laughs> so, but um, I, 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 I sat down with a few, quite a number of business people, and I've spoken with them over the years, and I try to understand where they're coming from and where the banks are coming from and why a lot of them struggle. And I discovered something. The truth is, um, what he's talked about today is something that a lot of people in this part of the world do not take seriously when they're starting up a business. A lot of people don't. And it, it, you know, when you come to a bank, I'm, I'm not, I didn't come here to talk about finances really, that's the truth, but I'm going to hint at that towards the end. But I just thought to say this, um, when you come to a bank and you want financing, you want funding for one thing or the other, um, they're going to look at a lot of the things we've talked about here today concerning your business. And if you don't know those things, and you don't have those things, why should I give you money? You are not clear as to how your business is going to make money. You don't know who your customers are. You have a vague idea of how much it will cost. Why should we give you somebody else's money? Mind you, the money the bank is giving you is not the bank's money. It's somebody else's money. It's your money in your account. It's your money, your savings, your pension. That's what the bank is going to give to that guy. And so you think about that. Would you not want the bank to know what they are doing before they give somebody your money? Because tomorrow, you could go to the bank and the bank will say, okay, you know Mr. So-and-so and so that we give the money. Yeah, well, it's business bank. So we didn't get our money back, so I'm, we're really sorry. Please don't be offended. <laughs> Abi, no vex. So imagine if the bank comes and tells you no vex on your life savings. So people need to understand the basics. You know, like Tim Lane said, last year, 2017, United Nations, um, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, declared that 20% of only 20% of businesses in Nigeria survive the first few years, 20%. So that's two in 10 that make it. Why do you think that is? One of the things I've discovered is that a lot of them were not prepared. They were not prepared. And so Nigeria is really not a very, it's a harsh place to do business, but there are opportunities. So what do you need? Why is it that those 20% survive and some others do not? So you ask yourself that question. What do those 20% that survive, what do they have? Do you think is they survive because they have more money? No. I've seen businesses that had money that packed up. In fact, we have one recently. The person who started the business, very well, he comes from a rich home comes from a rich family, and he has a business, the office is in Lekki Phase 1, 
massive property. I don't want to mention the property because I'm sure a lot of people will know it if I mention it. It's in Lekki Phase 1. It has an eatery in it. It has a lot of things in it. They own the building. And somewhere at the top of the building, they started a butchery business. And if you go to this butchery, high-tech, high-end imported equipment, money, huge money went into the equipment that is in that place now. But what's the guy doing right now? After less than two years, he's selling it off. And he's looking for new tenants. He's looking for people to buy the equipment and all that. Why? The business did not make money. But this guy imported all his equipment. Now he's looking for people to buy those equipment and take up the space because he's not making money. So it's not because you have money that your business will survive. A major factor in the success or failure of businesses is whether a detailed objective and fact-based research was carried out before the business was started. And like I said, Tim Lane has already talked on all of this. Research. People do not ask questions. They do not research before they start up businesses. A lot of uh, multinational corporations today have research departments. They have marketing teams that do a lot of hard work before they introduce a new product. Before Indomie will introduce Indomie pepper chicken or pepper soup or Indomie suya or whatever, research work has gone in. A lot of background research work has gone into that. And they have teams that do that. Some people hire consultants to do that. Now we need to do the analysis for that business. So it's not, it's not just enough for me to tell you that you need to research, you need to do this, and do how do you do those things? Okay, I'm just going to quickly run, try and um, run through some of these things. Like I say, um, careful research and analysis is needed before your business is set up. So I'm just going to try to talk about some of the things that, the areas that we need to research on and how to go about getting such information, questions to ask yourself. And when you answer these questions, you have the information that you need to know how to proceed. Remember, what we are trying to do is to give the business a fighting chance at survival, but not just surviving, to thrive. You need to be able to get the business to thrive. So it's important for us to know that before we start the business, um, that the strategy elements should be consistent with the realities of the firm's external environment and should be... Should be and its own capabilities and resources. So, okay. All right, so I'm going to talk about something that um, is studied in marketing. A lot of, um, like I said, as you're an entrepreneur, you are your marketing manager, really. The truth about the matter is, we are setting up business to do what? So we can make money, right? If we are not selling, we cannot make money. And so one of the key things you need to understand is how, what your marketing strategy will be. So this is something that's studied in marketing, and um, some of you might have heard about it, others may not have, but I'm going to just briefly talk about that. So when we're talking about opportunity analysis, we'll focus on what's called the four C's in marketing. The four C's, okay? And so, what are those four C's? So the, you need to know, before you start up a business, you need to know the needs, <coughs> wants, and characteristics of current and potential customers. Needs, wants, and characteristics of current and potential customers. What's the difference between a need and a want? I'm sure we've heard that before. Needs and wants. What's the difference between a need and a want? Simply put, a need is an identified, identified gap 
okay, between your current state and your ideal state. There's a gap between your current state and the state you want to be in, your ideal state. So, I'm hungry. What does that mean? There's a gap between my current state, which is the state of being hungry, and my ideal state, which is the state of being satisfied. That is a need. You need to, you have to identify that need. That's a need. So, what then is a want? I'm thirsty. That means there is a gap between my current state, which is a state of being thirsty, and the ideal state of not being thirsty. So that's my need. The question is, what is my want? But you know that when you are thirsty, there are so many ways in which you can satisfy that thirst. I can drink water. I can drink coke. I can drink a smoothie. I can drink beer. I can drink tea. So there are so many. So the want now is the, my preference for satisfying that need becomes my want. And so what you need to know as a business person is what would make my offering the preferred option for satisfying the need. Because there are so many ways in which that one need of thirst can be satisfied. Obviously, you are not in the business of providing offerings for all of those needs. You are probably just speaking to one, like Coca-Cola. Coke, they are speaking to one. They are not doing tea, they are not doing smoothie, they are doing coke. So now, somebody is thirsty. That is a need. What will make that person choose Coca-Cola instead of drinking water? Or taking tea to satisfy that need. So, what you need to understand is you need to research the needs, wants, and characteristics of current and potential customers. Um, there's something that the previous speaker said here when he gave an example. He said, Who is the customer for Pampas? And the truth is, the customer is the person who has a need and a want, not just that he has a need and a want, but he has the capacity to buy your offering to satisfy that need. So someone who has a need and a want, but does not have capacity, is not your customer. So I have a need for a GWAG. <laughs> A Mercedes Benz <laughs> G class. But do I have the capacity to buy? So the person who is selling a Mercedes Benz G class and meets me, yes, I have a need and I want it. But do I have the capacity? You shouldn't be talking to me if I don't have the capacity, you're wasting your time. So you need to identify people who have the need and the wants and have the capacity to engage in that. Remember, let me let me just say this. Um, this view will help us as well when we are designing products and services for people. When people buy goods and services, they are not actually buying goods and services. What are they buying? People do not buy goods and services, they buy benefits. So if I have headache and I walk into a pharmacy and I buy a chosen brand of aspirin, I am not buying aspirin per se. I am buying pain relief. So every product, every offering should confer benefits because the market, the customer, is not buying your product for the product's sake. He's buying it for the benefits that he expects to receive. And so if I evaluate the benefit I expect to receive from a chilled bottle of Coke on a hot afternoon which I'm thirsty, I can put my hand in my pocket and say, okay, the benefit I will get from this is what the value I'm going to have with. And so I make the purchase. So it's not the coke in itself that I'm buying, it's the benefits that the coke confers. That's what I'm taking. And so you need to have that at the back of your mind that people do not buy goods and services, they buy benefits. 
So what benefits are there in your offering to them, in your goods or services? What is the benefit? Because that is what they are paying money for. So the second thing we need to look at when we are doing our business opportunity analysis is the company's resources and capabilities. Companies, resources, capabilities, and strategies. So you need to look at yourself. Now, the first thing you need to do is to look at the customer. Identify the market. There has to be a market for what I want to offer. Who are the markets? Where are they? We talked about um, segmentation when he was talking about uh, business model canvas. You need to identify your market and then segment because not every person in the market is for you. Not everybody is your target market. You need to identify who your target market are and where they are. So this first research is the most important. The most important. The customer. Because at the end of the day, the reason why you want to go into business is to be able to give benefits to these people and then get money from them. So you need to know who they are, where they are, how they think, how they behave, how they buy, who are the decision makers. For instance, a good example he gave earlier on, who is the customer for Pampas? Now, he, and he gave the answer as being the mother. Why? You need to understand who the decision maker is in every purchase. I might go to the market to buy Pampas, but at the end of the day, before I pick, I will pick up my phone and call Madame. Say, please, oh, this is what they have here. They have this, they have the blue one, the yellow one, the green one. Which one am I picking? Why do I do that? I'm the one in the shop. I'm the one with the money. But am I the decision maker there? No, I'm not. And so you need to understand this about your product. Who is the actual decision maker? Where are they? How do they think? Is there an opportunity there? Is that market likely to grow? Sometimes people go into business and the market is not so big, but there's potential for growth in that market. Sometimes people go into a market because it's a leverage to another market. And so you need to understand all of these things and do all of that analysis. Who are my customers? Where are they? How do they buy? How do they think? Who makes the decision? Is it likely to grow? And then, if your market is in a particular location, they need to be able to identify the category, even down to age of your market, depending on what you're selling. Not every product appeals to every age range. And so you need to know, if I'm selling something that appeals to teenagers, if I'm selling something that appeals to single mothers, or married women, or single men, or whatever. So you need to categorize your customers in that light. Then the next thing you do is to look at the company. Okay, now I've identified my market, my target market. I know what they think, I know what they want, I know what they need. Do I have what it takes to meet that need? So you look at yourself as a business. What are my capabilities? What are my um, resources? What are my strategies? What do I have? Do I have the necessary expertise to provide the service that is required? Do I have the necessary connections? Do I have the necessary know-how? Do I have the finances required? Can I get those things that I do not have? Where can I get them? Sometimes you might start a business not having everything you need. But it's important for you to know what you need so you can ask yourself these questions. Do I have them? If I don't have them, where can I get them? Can I partner with someone to get them? And so you look at the company. The third C that you look at is the environmental context in which the company will operate in the environmental context, what geographical location, what political situation, what are the technological trends in that environment that my business is going to operate in. Um, 
I got my first car in 2008. Since then, I've mainly gone around by driving, hardly take commercial vehicle. But of late, I find myself sometimes taking commercial vehicles. But what commercial vehicle am I taking? I'm sure most of us here know Uber, taxi five. Okay, now, um, someone who owns a yellow taxi business, what technological context is that person operating in now? Because, you know, you talk to these yellow taxi guys and they will tell you that, they will tell you their life story about Uber and taxi fire and what it has done to their business. Because it's so convenient. I can sit in my office, I want to go somewhere, my car is on ground, but I don't feel like driving. I don't bring up my phone. And in two minutes, somebody is calling me, I'm close to you, come downstairs. And I get into a vehicle, air conditioned, comfortable, relaxed, and somebody drives me to all the places I want to go to. And then when I get there, I get down, I don't even need to pay, maybe connected to my, my account. So I just get out of the car and walk away. And then the next time I plug in my phone, I do the same thing, bring me back to the office. Now, compare that to previously having to go and look for a taxi guy that will bring one very rickety, dusty, smelling taxi that maybe the last passenger he carried was carrying frozen fish. And the smell of the frozen fish is still coming from the boots. And you sit down in the car and it's dusty and hot. And you're in traffic. So, what's, you need to understand the context in which your business is going to be operating. The political environment that your business is going to be operating in. Nowadays, the government is talking more about diversifying the economy, agriculture, and agribusiness, and all of that. You know, so if I'm going into agriculture now, that's a different environmental context than, say, some five, ten years ago, agriculture in Nigeria. So you need to understand because the business is not going to operate in isolation. The environment impacts on you, both positively and negatively. So you need to understand all of that as well. And then you also need to look at the relative strengths and weaknesses of competitors. That's the fourth C. A lot of people do not pay attention to competition before they go into business. And they get in there and competition swallows them up. And people are struggling to make ends meet. They are struggling. Your margins are very thin and they are trying to compete with people who have been there before, who probably have more experience, have economies of scale, have the right connections, they can underprice you. So what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses of competition? Because if you are going into a business, unless you have first mover advantage, maybe you are going into an area where nobody is doing anything before, you are the first guy, uh -huh. probably. But more than likely, um, it's more likely that there are people already in that line of business, in that location that you want to operate in. So you need to factor them in. How am I going to do with these guys? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? If you know their strengths, you know what you're up against. If you know their weaknesses, you know how you can come in. So it's important to know all of that. Research who are your competitors. And let me just say something about competition briefly. Sometimes people don't really know how to identify competition. Let's assume that you are in bakery business. Maybe you make uh, egg roll, sausages, meat pie, and you have a business idea. Okay, I want to supply egg roll and meat pie. Maybe you live close to um, a business environment where there are a lot of offices. And you think to yourself, okay, I can supply these things to these people in the morning. A lot of times, people in the morning, they want to take tea. Uh, all these offices, they don't have what to take with the tea. So I can go to offices, I supply them the egg roll, the meat pie, and all of that they take with their tea. Right? So that's a good idea. So, but now you need to factor in what's your competition. You might think to yourself, your competition is everybody else who is selling egg roll and meat pie. Right? So maybe like the TFC and um, Swiss Sensation, Mr. Biggs. 
and some other people who make the same thing at your, at your competition. But that's true, but that's not entirely true. Some people take a carambre in the morning. The person saying a carambre is your competitor. Even though you are selling me five, it's not exactly the same product. But remember what I said earlier, needs and wants. The need is to satisfy the hunger in the morning. Now there are different ones that can satisfy that hunger. So every single one of them is a competition. So why should I take meat pie when I can take a caram bread in the morning first? Or beans? Why should I take meat pie from you? And so you need to know what you're up against. Okay? And so Okay, let me just, uh, like I said, most of what I'm talking about are things that he's already introduced, you know, he's already introduced with um, the need for us to do research. Like I said earlier on, when I sit down with some business owners and we are talking, you want the bank to finance you. And I'm asking you these questions. You don't know. You don't know who your competition is. You don't know what benefits your, meant, your product is meant to confirm. You don't know who your target market is. How big is it? How large is it? Is it a market that is likely to grow? Or is it a market that is shrinking based on the environmental context and the things going on? Those are questions you need to ask yourself. Those answers will help you. Remember, what we're trying to do is to ensure that your business has a chance at survival. And so it's important to ask these hard questions and get these answers. It gives you an edge. I'm not saying that, oh, look at it and then, oh, it's too tough, be discouraged. No. I think it's better to be prepared. Preparedness and planning gives your business that edge that is needed to survive. And not just survive, but to thrive. Okay. So when we are looking at the customers, I talked about understanding how attractive is that market. How attractive is the market? Um, it has to be clearly defined and evidence base of customer, customer pain or problem. So you are trying to solve a problem. You need to identify clearly the problem you are trying to solve and how big is it? How huge is that problem? How much will people be willing to pay for you to solve that problem for them? So the, your offering has to confer benefits. And if possible, delight. The problem, you know, he talked about, uh, he also talked about um, value proposition. And this is important when you are dealing with competition. What is going to make the customer buy your offering instead of the other person's own? What makes the difference? And that's when you need to identify your competitive advantage. What is that thing that I'm offering that makes it that delights the customer more than the next person's own. So if you don't know what the other person is offering, how do you compare with what you are offering? So that's why we talked about the importance of competition and analyzing your competition so that you know what their products are. You cannot know, you cannot compete with something you don't know. You cannot compete with something you don't know. You want to, you want to sell pastries to people in the morning and in that area. Have you done what the people, what they are currently taking, what they, what, what, um, what it's like. So what you do is you go to your competition and buy and taste it. Taste it. Know what it is. What they are offering. Why do they prefer it? And you taste it. How can you say you are competing with somebody and you've never patronized the person before? You need to patronize your competition. So you know what you're up against. And you know where they are, where they are missing it. And then you can take advantage. Okay, so these are things we need to look at that will help. Okay, so I'm just going to um, quickly touch on something else. I talked about this is to help you with your uh, business opportunity analysis. The three C and four C's: customers, company, context, and competitors. And there's something else that we also need to look at, and it's called critical success factors. Uh, 
success factors. So in most um, industries, in addition to hard to imitate elements of uh, that are firm specific, there are also a small number of critical factors that tend to separate winners from losers. We're trying to find out the things that will help the business to succeed. Those few factors that the industry's critical, those few factors are the industry's critical success factor. Okay, let me just talk. Um, just as an aside, when I'm saying using the word industry, um, maybe I should clarify the difference between an industry and a market. An industry, uh, because people hear those words a lot, and sometimes you might wonder what's industry, what's market. Put simply, the market is simply a group of people, a group of buyers, the people that buy. The industry is simply the people that sell, straight up. So if you are, if you are one of the people patronizing or buying a product or service, you are in that market for that product or service. If you are one of the producers or the sellers, you are the industry. Now, so in an industry, there are some things that make it easy for people to survive. That the, com the companies now, and then for others to fall. There are things that the people who succeed know and have that the people who do not do not have or do not know. And those are the things that are called critical success factors for that industry. Every industry has its own critical success factor. Now, you want to start up a business, which means you are going to become part of an industry. Correct. So, you need to also ask yourself, what are the critical success factors for my industry? What are the things that I need to have or know for my industry for me to succeed? And a simple way to, there are two questions you can ask yourself to help you identify critical success factors for your industry. Number one is, which few decisions or activities that are the ones that if got wrong will almost always have severely negative effects on the company's performance. Which few decisions or activities that if gotten wrong will almost always have severe negative impact on the company's performance? You need to find out those questions. Ask yourself that question. Take the industry you want to you want to compete in and ask yourself in this industry which decisions, key decisions or activities that if gotten wrong will almost always in fact will surely guarantee failure in that industry. So you need to research. People who are in the industry, people who have studied the industry, you need to research. What are those key decisions? What are those key activities that you've got to know will negatively impact the company? Number two, it's basically the reverse. Which decisions or activities done right will almost always deliver disproportionately positive effects on the performance? The key decisions that if done right will always deliver um, positive effects, huge positive effects on that industry. If you cannot answer these two questions, you are not ready to compete in that industry. You are not ready. Do not waste your time, do not waste your resources until you can answer these questions. Very, very important. Because these are called critical success factors for that industry. So, um, aside from the four C's for your business opportunity analysis and the critical success factors, there are some other considerations to bear in mind when setting up, when starting a business. Um, opportunities are only as good as people who pursue them. If there's an opportunity and the right people are not pursuing that opportunity, that opportunity um, 
will no longer look like an opportunity. So even if some combination of markets and industry factors renders an opportunity attractive at first glance, there still remains some crucial, crucial um, um, questions that you still need to answer. Uh, most of what I'm talking about today uh, is in line of giving us questions to ask. I'm just trying to equip us with the right questions because if you ask the right questions, you get the right answers. You get the right answers, you stand a better chance of thriving in your business. So, there are still some other questions to ask. One other question that you can ask is, does this opportunity fit what we want to do? Does this opportunity, because not every opportunity is for you. Um, the first speaker talked about your expertise and your training and your passion. There might be opportunity in an area that you are not passionate about. It doesn't change the fact that it's an opportunity, but does it fit what you want to do? Is it an opportunity you can run with? Or you just run with an opportunity just because it's an opportunity? I, like I said, an opportunity is only as good as the people pursuing them. And so if you are not primed to run with an opportunity, it will be a waste of time and resources. And so you need to find out, does this opportunity fit what we want to do. Secondly, do we have or can we attract the people who can execute on whatever it takes to be successful in this particular industry? People, do we have or can we attract the right people? Can I attract the right people necessary for what I want to do? Or do I already have person, the people, and then together you can't be able to um, be successful in that business. And sometimes people try to go it alone. A lot of business people try to go it alone, and you want to do everything yourself. Even the things you, the things you know and the things you do not know. You are, you are, you are setting yourself up to fail. You are setting yourself up to fail. Why not admit the areas that you are good at and the areas that you are lacking? and then see how you can partner with people who are good in that area so you can be successful. That brings me to my third question, which is, do we have the right connections? Do we have the right connections to be successful in this industry? Now, as the saying goes, it's not what you know, but who you know. Who you know. Connections are key. And when I say connections, what do I mean by connections? You know, there are some people who, whose um, competitive advantage is pricing. There are some businesses. If you look at businesses like uh, ShopRite, their competitive advantage is what? Pricing. For, for a business, for most retail um, retailers who be in fast-moving consumer goods like ShopRite do, their, their key, usually their key competitive advantage are two things. One, pricing, two, location. Why is location important? Because of convenience. People want to be able to walk into that place and buy everything they want to buy easily. They want to be able to move around. So location for retailers is key because it, it, it provides what convenience. Because the kind of product they sell are what you call convenience goods. Toothpaste, washing soap, I mean, those are all things that I want to go out of my way to go and look for to buy. I can pick it at the nearest location. So if you are not properly located and you are dealing with that kind of business, you will struggle. So one other thing that they have for that they have for them is pricing. So how is it that ShopRite is able to sell things cheaper than their bulky on your street? How? I mean, short, big store with big staff and big overhead costs, how is it that they are cheaper than the, the person, the trader who sells by the street? Connection. Where are they sourcing their products from? They have the capacity to source it really, really cheaply. So that underscores the importance of who you know. Sometimes the key to surviving your business is where you are able to source your materials from. Do you have the connections that others do not? 
that can be a competitive advantage in itself. Do you have the network that others do not? And sometimes people sell you things and like, ah, where are you getting this, your product from? Ah, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Ah, where do you get these things from? And at this price, they, such things for such businesses are closely guarded secrets. Closely guarded secrets because that's their competitive advantage. They have connections also when it comes to distribution. Do you have the right channels? Do you have the channels that other people do not? And so you are able to offload your products faster than most other people in your industry. Why? Because you have connections downstream. People who take the product quickly. You are able to make the right connection. Someone who I know that, goes, that you know, is in agri business, poultry, and she sells eggs. She has good connections both ways. She's a middle man and she sources her eggs directly from producers. Very cheap, good quality eggs. And then she's able to make a connection with ShopRite so that she supplies them eggs. So she has connections back end and up front. So she sources those products. ShopRite doesn't know the guy who's producing the egg. But she's making good money. Why? She's not producing eggs. She's not the one selling the eggs. She's just in between. And that's connections. She can source the eggs from the producers and deliver to ShopRite and make good money. So who you know is important. Do we have the right connections to be successful? Critical success factors again. Talking about what are those key activities and decisions? Do we have the right connections? So if you do not have the right connections, how can you get the right connections? And then finally, what would be our sustainable competitive advantage and how can we develop it? Competitive advantage. Competitive advantage simply means that thing that gives you an edge over your competitors. You are all in the same industry. Why is it you that the customers are patronizing? What do you have? What's that your edge? What's your competitive advantage? I gave an example with the likes of ShopRite, pricing and convenience. Their competitive advantage is not customer service. Such places, you don't go there expecting customer service. You don't get customer service in ShopRite. There is nothing, nobody's going to try and make you oh, feel all good and feel nice. How was your day? No, 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 no. Next. Next. And so if you want to go and push customer service, you're wasting your time. People who want to buy convenience goods are not looking for customer service. They want cheap and availability. Simple. It's available and it's cheap. So what is your own competitive advantage for what you want to sell? That thing that you have that other, um, other competitors do not. So let me just quickly round up um, by saying that, sorry, before I round up, was anybody expecting me to mention money as a critical success factor? Was anybody expecting me to mention money? Most times people expect me to mention money as a critical success factor. But what is money? <laughs> what's finances? What's, what's funding? You know, like I said, I didn't come here to talk much about financing. Um, but I will mention it because that's my field. But the truth is, I, I was hoping that by the time we are done with the things we need to say, you will see that money so far has not really been mentioned here. Why? Money is, money is um, something that, what would I call money with, for a business? It's something that is good to have, okay, for your business, but does not guarantee success in your business. That's the truth. It doesn't guarantee success. And the truth is, truth is, if you get these things right, somewhere along the line you will get the money. Somewhere along the line, you will get the money, either by way of investment, investors, or partners, or even banks. The truth is, if you get these things right, you are easier to fund. You are in a better position to be funded or invested in. So when people want to start a business, and the first thing they are thinking is, I don't have money. You have got it wrong. You've missed it already. Money should not be the first thing you should think about. 
Leave the money. Answer these questions. Answer these questions. If you answer these questions well, you will be able to get the money. So let me not waste time talking too much about money. But answer this question. But like I said, from my experience, a lot of people who approach banks for funding have not even looked at these things. It just hasn't even crossed their minds. It hasn't even crossed their minds. I was once approached by a customer of mine who is into IT, ICT. He's an um, electrical engineer, I think, or electronics engineer by training. He's worked in ICT for almost 15 years and uh, in different ICT companies in, in Lagos. And then one day he comes up to me and says that he needs a loan. I said, really? You need a loan? For what? He said he wants to, yeah, there's an opportunity that he wants to go into. I said, opportunity? Okay, what kind of opportunity? He said he wants to be dealing, selling petroleum products, oil and gas. I said, really? So how much do you need? He said, like... 50 million or 70 million sha. Okay, so 50 million or 70 million sha. Not specific, you're not sure. Uh, okay, just say, okay, okay, 50 million, 50 million. I said, uh, okay. So, what exactly are you going to use the 50 million to do? Say, well, that there's opportunity. He has some people that he knows who are selling, bringing in petroleum products. So, I mean, they'll be lifting, they'll be delivering diesel, PMS, blah, 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 blah. I said, uh. <laughs> I said, oh, God. <laughs> You, you, need to, you, need to, you need to go and define a lot of things, first of all. First of all, you are in ICT. That's what you know. That's your expertise. That's your gift. You've been doing that for 15 years. You wake up one morning, you get a brainwave that you want to go into oil and gas. <laughs> you want to start selling petroleum products. And the first thing you do is to come to the bank to give you 50 million. To go and, in other words, I want to go and see if I can do this thing. Shall I? Why don't you people give me, give me some people's money? Let me go and try. If I don't get it, well, hey, yeah. Uh oh, hey, yeah. <laughs> so it's somebody's money you want to go and use to learn, to see whether you can do oil and gas business. So, okay, you need to go and define what you want to do very well. Go and define it. Yes, does it mean that there's no opportunity in the oil and gas? He might have actually identified a good opportunity. But it comes back to what we said earlier on. Is that your expertise? Is that what you know? Is it something that is in line with what you do? It might be an opportunity, but is it in line with what you do? It's an opportunity for somebody else, maybe not you. And you need to look for an opportunity for something that you do. So, um, I want to just I want to conclude by saying whether you are in Whether you are in business, an entrepreneur, or paid employment, the most important thing The most important thing is find a problem you can solve and get paid to do it. Whether you're in business or in paid employment. Find a problem that you can solve. Get paid to do it. And last time I was here, I talked about the importance of value and how people make money. And money is actually an exchange of value. Find a problem that you can solve. The world is full of problems. The world is full of problems. Business is problem solving. What is the problem that you can solve? You, me. This is a problem I have identified that I can solve. How, can I, how do I know I can solve it? Because I've looked at myself. I have the expertise. I have the training. I have the knowledge. Or I can attract those things to solve that problem. I talked about a need. What is a need? A need is a gap in somebody's state. Okay? I, they, my preferred state and my desired state, there's a gap. I need somebody to help bridge that gap. I am willing to exchange value to that person for bridging that gap. So we need to understand what is the problem that I can solve. 
before you go into that business, what is that problem that I have identified that I can solve and I can be paid for solving it and so that I can now go and do my homework on all the other things, prepare myself to be paid to solve that problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any, any question? Yeah, we'll take the question now. So. <laughs>